morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us here at Lighthouse Community Church for our online service. I'd like to take this time to welcome and invite everybody to join us in worship for this lovely Sunday. Who breaks the power? Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole
I'll pray. Lord God, we thank you so much for this time. We thank you so much for just being able to worship together as a church, God. Um, and I just pray that we could just open up our hearts to you, continue to open up our hearts to you during this sermon, God. I pray that no matter what our weeks are looking like, no matter what our lives are like right now, whether we're in trials, whether we're in storms, um, I just pray that we could remember your grace and just completely fall into you and surrender to you and just lift up this service to you and bring you glory. And I just pray that you help take away any distractions right now, help us fully to focus on you and just to learn about you and dive into your word, God, and we pray that um, we lift this service up to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining our worship service today. Here's a look at this week's announcements. A reminder that you can continue to support the ministries and staff of LCC through offering. You can give your offering via e-transfer through your banking app or website. Details can be found on our website at lighthouseyyc.ca slash give. Children's Ministry is looking for volunteers to pack and deliver supply boxes for the kids. Supply boxes are a key part of our children's ministry. The boxes are full of materials for games and crafts, and they help make our lessons memorable. Packers, please meet at church on Tuesday, September 8th at 7 p.m. Worship Ministry will be having an orientation day and appreciation dinner on Saturday, September 19th. Orientation will start at 2.30 p.m. at church, and dinner will begin at 5.30 p.m. If you are interested in volunteering for the worship ministry, now would be a great time to join. Our worship teams are looking for singers, instrumentalists, and technicians. Please contact either David Tran or Sam Fan for more information. We will celebrate communion at the end of this service. To participate, please have bread and juice ready when the sermon ends. The COVID-19 pandemic has impacted many of us this season. If you are struggling during this time, please let our pastors or leaders know. We would like to pray for you and assist you in the ways that we can. If you have any further questions or comments about our church events or ministries, we love to hear from you via email at info at lighthouseyyc.ca. You can also connect with us during the week on our social media platforms, such as our Facebook page, Instagram account, or on our YouTube channel. Our service continues with Pastor David's message in just a moment.
If we all work together and know and follow public health rules, we can help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Stay informed with current and accurate information at alberta.ca slash COVID-19. A message from the Government of Alberta. If you would like to share what God has been doing in your life recently, or if you have a prayer request, record a short 30-second to 1-minute video and upload it to lighthouseyyc.ca slash godsightings. You can also DM us your selfie video at LighthouseYYC on Instagram or send a text email to GodSightings at LighthouseYYC.ca. We'll share it within our church community and on our live stream. LCC and everyone else watching on YouTube or on Facebook. We want to thank you for joining us. And before we start with the sermon, I just want to quickly pray. So let's pray. God, thank you so much for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for blessing us with this great, unusual summer, God, but we just still thank you for it, God. And Lord, I, I pray for the sermon. I pray, God, that we have an encounter with you. I pray we have an experience with you in our hearts in minds and imaginations today. God, I thank you so much for everything, Lord. And I pray we leave after watching this transformed and have more of a knowledge of you. In your name we pray, amen. If you ever take a look at your life and ask yourself, what is the funniest mistake you've ever made? What would you say? I have two kids and they always make mistakes, but they're always funny. And I remember when they were little, they would make all the mistakes in the world, but for some reason it was hard for me to get mad at them or to yell or scream because it was just too adorable. It was too cute. It was too funny to get upset. Like I couldn't be mad with a straight face. I remember this one time, Jalen. Uh, he came back with a math test. And if you know Jalen, he's super smart at math. He always gets A's. He always does really well. And he comes back with a math test. And he's like, he came like disappointed. Like he was upset. He was like, Ugh. And he was upset because he got one question wrong. So I was like trying to talk to him, trying to calm him down. You know, it can't be 100% all the time. And so he showed me the, the test. I'm like, well, what question did you get wrong? And, and so he showed me. And it said... The question was, are there more chickens or are there more cows? And Jalen's answer was simply, yes, yes. On, on a math test, it wasn't a number, it wasn't an equation, it was just simply, yes. And when I looked at it, I just laughed and I thought it was so funny because technically he, he was right. Yes, there are more chickens than there are more cows, but he was supposed to show show it through a math equation or show it uh, by using numbers. So uh, we were just laughing at him. So we thought it was the funniest mistake. You know, people make mistakes all the time. Sometimes the mistakes are small. Like one time I was driving in downtown and I drove onto a one-way street and we were driving all these cars were coming towards us. And we, were about, ah, we were screaming and we thought, we thought it was so scary. So we, we drove off to onto the side of the road and you know at the time it was super scary it was like frightening but today we we laugh at it we think it was the funniest thing but you know people make mistakes some of them make big mistakes and it causes a lot of pain like i've i've, I've known friends who have committed huge crimes and right now they're in jail um, I, I have a friend that committed adultery on his on his wife and in the end he lost his whole family lost his kids he lost his wife and he was left with nothing and it was just a lot of pain and all of them would say that they're christians so don't think christians are incapable of making big mistakes they make mistakes all the time there's this assumption that once you become a Christian, that all of a sudden you're just like perfect and you never make mistakes. But I want to talk about one common mistake 
that all Christians struggle with. You know, I would even argue that this is probably the biggest mistake um, or everything is essentially tied to this mistake in some way. But if we can deal with this one mistake, it would change our lives for the better. So we're continuing our series in Jeremiah again. Jeremiah lived in a time when God's people were not living right. They were really corrupt. So, so corrupt that God had to do something. He had to judge them. He had to take their homeland away from them. And they were into all kinds of trouble. They were all in, onto a lot of evil things, lots of injustice, even horrible things like child sacrifice. They were all, they were a part of that. But everything boiled down to one critical mistake that encompasses almost everything. And that one mistake is this, it's idolatry, idolatry. And this is the same mistake for us as well. So our passage today comes from Jeremiah chapter 2, but we were going to focus on one verse today, verse 13, because I think it encompasses the whole passage. So verse 13, if you want to open your Bibles to Jeremiah chapter 2, verse, verse 13, it says this, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, we can understand idolatry in two parts from this passage. Is that one, idolatry means leaving God behind. And two, idolatry means embracing a counterfeit God. Embracing a counterfeit God. God. So a while back, my, my aunt um, had a boyfriend, and she told me this story about him. Well, now he's his, it's her ex-boyfriend, and he shared the story about how he was supposed to pick her up from work, but he forgot. So he was supposed to pick up my aunt at work, and for some reason, he forgot. And she waited two hours for him. Two hours at work for him to come and finally he came and by that time my aunt was super upset you know my aunt waited for him but then when he came she refused to like go inside the car I was like no I don't I mean she's so upset she's getting up really mad and so she didn't even want to get into the car so the boyfriend's like driving by on the road it's like come on come inside I'm so sorry but she's like no I don't want any of it she, he forgot her like, how does one forget someone that is very, supposedly supposed to be very important to her? It reminds me of that famous uh, Simpsons episode where Homer forgot to pick up Bart from, the so from his soccer practice. And here's a clip of that. Dad, what are you? Tonight on Wings! Ah, who cares? <laughs> Simpson, pick up Bart. Pick up Bart! Trapuke Sip! Trapuke Sip! What have we told you about writing on the walls? Go to your room! After 16 glorious seasons, the Green Bay faithful bid farewell to Brian Bartlett Starr. I keep thinking I'm forgetting something. Bart! 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 Can't think with all this noise. What am I supposed to do? Pick up Bart. Pick up Bart. Pick a bar. What the hell is pick a bar? Shut up, Flanders. 
Hey, boy. Always soccer practice. Can you imagine forgetting to pick up your son or picking up your wife or your girlfriend and just forgot to pick them up after work? It would be a big deal. Someone would be in so much trouble. Now, this is what happened to Israel. Israel had forgotten God. They forgot about their first love. They forgot about what was supremely important. They forgot about God to the point that they slowly drifted away. They slowly started to leave God, to forsake God. Like in verse 13, it says, My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water. Now in the history of Israel, God was their spring of water. Israel was a nation built around this love relationship. They had a covenant with God. When their relationship with God was going well, God would bless them. So they, they flourished. They did really good. They were at their best. But when things were good, they somehow forgot about God. They forgot about what God did for them. Their eyes began to wander. You know, they began to look around, begin to wander at the other nations surrounding Israel. And then they would start to question, you know, we have this relationship with God, but look at all these other nations. They, they start to question, why is the other nations, they, they seem bigger. Why, why is the other nations are more powerful, they're more prosperous. So they're looking around, they're wandering. So God's people start copying the other nations. They start copying them, including the worship of other gods. Now, a different god is not just another name or a change of religion, but it's a different story to build your life around. It becomes like a different narrative to shape your life around. The other gods were not at all like Yahweh. Now, if you ever read like Greek mythology or the Greek mythology gods and their stories, uh, if you read it, it's always like one big chaotic soap opera. You know, it's like, like Young and the Restless, but on a massive scale. And humanity is like caught up in this story. So believing in different gods meant believing in a different narrative and it's a story that shapes your life it's it's a story that shapes how you behave we all have narratives in our heads you know we all have a way of seeing or viewing the world around us we all have a story to make sense of the world to make sense of reality like in the 21st century, our culture and Hollywood have an enticing story. You know, they give us a story of what reality looks like. And it's, it's enticing. You know, just turn on the TV. You know, click. Watch TV. Watch Netflix. What does satisfaction look like? You know, look, watch the commercials. What does satisfaction look like? Usually it looks like beauty. Um, usually it's romance, prestige, status, money. And we are told that this is the good life. If we play our cards right, if we do everything right, we can be satisfied like what, with what we see on the TV. But the Christian narrative is different. It tells, that, t it tells us that only in Jesus... Are we ultimately satisfied? That we're ultimately sat only Jesus can ultimately satisfy us in the end. Everything else is temporary. Unfortunately, most Christians are more exposed to a Hollywood um, story th there than we are to the narrative of the Bible. Most Christians watch a lot of TV. Uh, they watch more TV than they read their Bible. The narrative shaping our minds 
are more from culture than from a biblical point of view, from a biblical worldview. So if you, if you take politics, for, for example, uh, we shape our politics more from the culture and not from the Bible. One study said that the average American watches 2,737 hours of TV in a year. Now, if you do the math, instead of an hour of TV before bed, we could read the entire Bible in six months. Here's another one. The average guy spends 10,000 hours playing video games by age 21. Author John, author John Mark Comer, he prides this insight. He says, in, in 10,000 hours, you could master any craft, become an expert in any field. You could even memorize the entire New Testament. Or you could beat level four of Call of Duty. So we have a dilemma here. Like, where are our priorities? We need to do something about our priorities and our life balance. It's all out of sorts. If we don't, then our hearts will begin to drift. You know, it's easy to say that we love God. Like everyone will say, oh, I, love, oh, I love Jesus, he's, he's the best. But if we're not actually fighting the story that the culture gives us, then eventually we will drift in the wrong direction spiritually. We need to go back to the right narrative. We need to return to our first love, the love of the Father. We need to deliberately work on it to return to back to an understanding of the biblical story. Returning back to spiritual disciplines of like friendship with God, relationship with God, through prayer, through fellowship, through community with others, driving toward the goal of getting the story right in your mind and in your hearts, fitting everything, your life, fitting your life into the biblical narrative. And if you do, you will find living water. Just as the people were meant to live out, to find this living water in Jeremiah's time. Jesus said in John chapter 7 verse 28, he, he said, Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. That believing in Jesus is, doesn't necessarily mean believing that he existed and that he's real but it's also living out his story, which means this, narrative matters. Whatever narrative you have, it matters. So the first mistake we see here is, is that to leave the real God behind because we are too busy for him and our minds are too full of other things to think about his story. The second mistake, is embracing a counterfeit God. Embracing a counterfeit God. I, I was at a youth conference once in Edmonton, and in the conference they they had this place where it was kind of like a convenience. Well, I don't know if you would call it a convenience store. It was more like a it was like a bookstore. And in the bookstore they would have like posters and stuff, and then they would also have like candy or like gum or some level of food or chocolate bars and stuff. So I, I went in and I was like looking at the books and oh, this is a nice book. Or, and they had CDs there too, cause there was like, there were concerts and stuff. So I'm like, oh yeah, maybe I'll check out this CD. But one of the things I needed was, was gum. Like, oh my God, my breath stinks, I need gum. So I, I was looking for gum and I'm like, I couldn't find any gum. So I go up to the, the cashier or the person working there. I'm like, oh, excuse me, do you guys have gum? And it's like, oh yeah, we, we sure do. And she hands me this gum and it's called Testaments. Testaments. Wait, Testaments? What, what's a Testament? And I look closely to it. It was Christian gum. Christian gum? It was a Christian imitation of the real thing. 
I'm like, well, what's wrong with secular gum or, you know, what's wrong with like real gum, like dentine ice or Excel? What now? Well, why do I need testaments? So it was like a Christian ripoff. And when I tasted it, I'm like, oh my gosh, like Excel tasted way better. And I, as I started looking around this whole Christian store or convenience store that they had here, they had so many imitations of everything. There was a poster there and it was like, wow, a poster. And I thought it said Facebook, but it didn't say Facebook. It said Faith Book. I was like, oh, okay. And then there's another one. It said GodTube instead of YouTube. But it's not just Christian culture. You know, we can make fun of Christian culture or whatnot, but it's not just Christian culture. We have imitations in the overall culture as well. Like for example, you know, Coke or Pepsi, they're usually like the top Coca-Cola drinks. But then we could have like the Walmart brand or the one from Shoppers. And I don't know, for me, they don't taste like the real thing. They're not better. They're just imitations. Or that juice powder. You know, instead of getting orange juice, you can get Tang. You know, we used to have that at our church. Like whenever we had a oh, fellowship time, everyone would just take a drink of Tang. It was like this juice powder, but it never tasted better than the real thing. It may look the same. It may, you know, be the same color, but you soon find out once you taste it that it isn't the same. It's not even better. Now, if we look at the second half of this verse, it said that they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. Now, a cistern in the Middle East is, is like a water reservoir. It's useful in places like, you know, those semi-desert um, environments in which there are no running water. You know, there's no running water in the pipes. People would build these cisterns in places like right outside their house, which was more convenient than walking towards a spring. So a cistern is, is great. It's a, a really good thing. But if it's broken, if it's a broken cistern, then it's not very good. A broken cistern doesn't do anything. It, it, will, it will leak and eventually the water, water will run out. Now, this metaphor of water represents life. It represents the flourishing of life, like life lived to the full. But with the Israelites, they're trying to find this life, this water in the wrong place, whether they're trying to find it in money. Yet Jesus is saying this, Jesus is saying, it's only found in me. It's only found in me. There can be no imitations. I am the real thing. You know, everyone has ultimate hope in life. They put ultimate hope in something in life. But if it's not Jesus, it will be like a broken cistern. It doesn't matter what you replace God with, it will leak and eventually run out. When, when I was a, a kid in Sunday school, um, everyone would have like this sticker chart, sticker chart. And then you have your like your names of your the people in your class and stuff. And then if you did, if you got a good, if you answer the question right, you'd get like a happy face or some sort of sticker next to your name. If you answer the questions right. Now my happy face chart was always filled with stickers. I was just like, so good. Like I just, I, I just was just a great student. But why was I so good? Why was I so good? It's because I always answered with Jesus. Every question they asked, whatever way they framed it, would always, the answer would always be Jesus. Jesus would technically be the, always be the right answer. Now, if they, they can't say, oh, you're wrong. They couldn't say that or that they would be wrong. So the answer was always Jesus. Now, the answer to every question, Sunday school question is Jesus. And there's a reason for that. Like if you look at Romans chapter 11, verse 36, it says, For from him and through him and for him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Meaning this, Jesus is the source of all the things. He's the source of all things. 
the operating force behind all things and the purpose of all things. And if we don't live for Jesus, we will live for something else. If it's not Jesus, it will be something else. We will worship something else. We will put our hope and trust in something else. It will be something or it will be someone that will try to replace God. For some people, they chase and live their life for money. They live for it. Sure, money is a gift from God. There's nothing wrong with money. But if you put too much hope in it, if you put too much trust in it, it'll eventually let you down. It's what happened to Marcus Person, creator of Minecraft, you know, the popular game. He sold the game and he sold the game that he created for something seemingly better, you know, billions of dollars. He bought a big house. He hung out with big time celebrities. And then soon after he tweeted that, yes, he has lots of money. Yes, he's hanging out with all these celebrities, but he still feels lonely. He still feels lonely. You know, relationships or romance can also be a temporary thing. You know, you watch those rom-coms on Netflix and, you know, I enjoy them my, myself. But Hollywood always glorifies the chase. You know, it always glorifies the, the chase in the relationship. And, you know, I've been there. You know, it's really fun. But after you've caught the girl and you're like, all right, yeah, I got her. Many people all of a sudden suddenly find couples being together boring. You know, they, they soon find, hmm, what, what happened to the butterflies, you know? Uh, what happened to that thrill that we used to have? And then we start questioning, well, maybe I should chase something else. I want that feeling back. But why do we feel that way? It's because we were never... The chase was never meant to be the thing that fulfills us ultimately. It, it can be a gift, but it will never be the thing. It was never meant to be the thing that fulfills us and satisfies us ultimately. In the end, there's nothing in creation that can ultimately satisfy us because we are made for God. We're made for God. You know, my favorite quote from St. Augustine is this. He says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. In other words, every human being has this God-shaped hole in their heart. And only God can fill it. Only God can take away this hunger in our souls, only Jesus can do it. When we look at the things that we have, you know, thing when God gives us money and he gives us relationships, they are all good things, but they are meant to be seen as gifts only. Like they're gifts. They're not ultimate things, but they are gifts. It's kind of like my house. Like I love my house. Like I love, I love living in it and everything, but they're gifts, gifts to bless someone, maybe gifts to, maybe it's a gift to, to share, whether it's like inviting people over for dinner or hospitality, maybe you have a spare room in your house. Maybe someone can live in it for a while if they're, while they're looking for their, a new place to live. I don't know, but we can share these things, but these good things, they cannot replace God. They cannot. Romance, money, status, they cannot replace God. It is a God-shaped hole in our hearts and only God can fill that hole. So when we look at these great things or good gifts, we, we need to use these gifts to get the ultimate gift, which is a relationship with God. And only within only within your relationship with God 
do your temporary gifts have meaning and lead to long-term impact and joy? So as Christians, we all make the common mistake, and it's a big one. We all struggle with idolatry. And idolatry means this, it's leaving behind the real God leaving behind the real God and embracing a counterfeit God. And all of us do this. All of us struggle with this. And maybe you're watching this today. And some of us here watching are, are drifting. We're drifting slowly. We're starting to leave God behind. We're starting to leave God behind. And we need to return back. We need to go back to God. We need to spend that time working on the right narrative, capturing the right narrative of our lives and returning back to God. And we can do this um, by going back to whether it's Christian friendships, dwelling on the Bible that will help us drive toward a life that fits into the Christian story. And some of us here watching has already left God. And maybe you've already embraced a counterfeit God. You've embraced a counterfeit God. And maybe if you're honest, you feel disappointed. You've embraced something and you're like, oh, I hope it fills me. But then you're left. Maybe you're feeling disappointed. Maybe you're feeling not satisfied. It wasn't as good as you thought it would be. And there's some maybe feelings of regret. Maybe you are exhausted. I want to encourage you today that God is waiting for you with open arms. He will not reject you. He will always welcome you back. So when we look at these gifts, let's use these gifts of life to get the ultimate prize, which is a relationship with God. Let's pray. God, we, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. I just pray, God, for today that some of us here are struggling with idolatry. I think all of us are struggling with idolatry. You know, we're wand we have wandering eyes. We start looking at what people have and what people are doing and like, oh my gosh, I want that for myself too. And we start to drift away from God. We start to leave God. We start to forsake God. And some of us here have, have left God completely and we have, we've embraced the counterfeit God. But Father, maybe some of us here have done that, but we feel disappointed. We feel not satisfied. And then we feel too ashamed to go back to you. But God, you welcome us with open arms. Just like the, in the story of the prodigal son, you run out to us waiting to embrace us i pray father that today if that's us that lord we will go back to you we will return to you we will turn back to the narrative that we once believed and lived god help us to go back to it help us to go back to you whether it's through prayer through fellowship through community god we thank you for everything in your name we pray. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. These are the symbols that set apart the real God from every counterfeit that is out there. Every God from every other religion and every other top priority that might replace God in our lives. From these symbols, we understand a lot about God. We understand His justice. God's justice for wrongs that have been done, the demanded a sacrifice and a punishment. And Jesus was punished for us. 
These symbols remind us of the power of God to die for us and to destroy death for us so that we could live forever. And these symbols remind us of the kindness of God and the sweetness of God, his love for us that caused him to give his life for us. And he still loves us with that same love, even today. This is the glory of God. And by these symbols, we know that we have found the one that our heart was searching for, that there is no other God that could be like him, not even one that we make up and try to make it as perfect as we can. None will ever be as good as this one. This one who came down in history and really did this for us. That's what we celebrate at communion. So let's eat together. Body of Christ, given for you. Blood of Christ, shed for you. We'll end with the Lord's Prayer. It goes like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace.